of hours, Gibson says, are the beating heart of his Catholic faith. A Christ who transcends agony and redeems the darkness of the world by perfect goodness and light. He was beaten for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgressions. And by his wounds, we are healed. That's the point of the film. It's, it's not about pointing the fingers. It's not about playing the blame game. It's about faith, hope, love, and forgiveness. That's a reality for me. I believe that. I have to. Have to? I have to. For? For my own sake. For so you. I can hope. So I can live. Oh. And Mr. Gibson over here no, to your left. The Not the kind of thing you often hear from one of the reigning princes of Hollywood, where Mel Gibson made his millions being funny, and a fighter, brave heart, and heartthrob. You don't have to sort of put the grab on him so much. But he says this is the movie he was compelled to make. You could have made a life of Jesus. Yes. Why the 12 hours? I think that's the most intense part of the gospel account. It's the central point of what Christians believe. I mean, it's our belief that by the sin of the first people, original sin, that the gates were closed to us, to eternal life, and that his sacrifice as a redeemer of all mankind was to open the gates to all of us again. His film starts in the Garden of Gethsemane. A frightened Jesus chooses to accept God's will that he should die. Even today, if you go to Jerusalem, some scholars point out there are many escape routes from Gethsemane, but the Bible says Jesus chose not to take them. Instead, to be arrested and tried by the priests of the Jewish temple in a council gathering called a Sanhedrin. His skin flayed by Roman guards. It's called scourging. And then the crushing procession up the hill. In Gibson's film, it becomes an intricate, almost unrelenting choreography of pain. He falls a lot. When he falls, he's going to have to fall in different ways, and it's going to have to say different things. That particular fall was almost like ballet. It was sort of a lyrical um, fall, and it's got lyrical sounds behind it. It's not quite real, and um, even you even see it from his point of view for a little while. What you see is his mother Mary, not far from her, Mary Magdalene, the sinner who stayed by Jesus' side. You also see an unsettling face with shaved eyebrows, which turns demonic. It's Gibson's huh. idea of satanic evil in the world. It's attractive, yet it's intimidating. Masculine, yet feminine. For me, I think evil is a, something that, when it comes to you, it's, it's not necessarily going to come with a sign saying, I'm evil. Uh, it usually will come in an enticing form. And you said at one point, that a big dark force didn't want us to make this film. Sure. What was the force? What was the force? It's the thing you can't see. See, if you... I, I'm a believer, by the way. So if you believe, you believe that there are big realms of good and evil, and they're slugging it out. What does the evil side want? Oh, it wants you. It wants you. People are capable of horrors, of atrocities. We're also capable of wonderful things, of good things. And we have the choice. What do we choose, you know? And often, many of us, at different times, choose both things. Which brings us to another story you can, in a sense, also see in the shadows on the screen. Gibson says the seed of this film was planted 13 years ago in his personal struggle with self-destruction and despair. Let's face it, I've been to the pinnacle of what secular utopia has to offer. Right? It's just this kind of everything. I've got money, fame, this, that, the other, you know, and it's all been like, whoosh, like here, here you go, like that. And it's like, okay. And when I was younger, I got my proboscis out and I dipped it into the font and sucked it up, all right? It didn't matter. There wasn't enough. It wasn't good enough. It's not good enough. It leaves you empty. The more you eat, the emptier you get. How bad did it get? Oh, you know, pretty bad. I think everybody in their life gets to a point where that happens, I think, where they get to the moment of truth and they go, well, what is this all about? Am I going to jump? Am I going to go on? I don't want to do either. I don't want to live. 
I don't want to die. You ask yourself all those Hamlet questions, and eventually you just have to say, I'm not good enough to figure this out. I don't know. I just don't know. Help! If there's anything out there, help, you know. And uh, if you're lucky, you'll recognize the signs of that help. So what caused the crisis? More on that later. But as Gibson's reborn spirituality led him to spend his own money making a movie about crucifixion, and not only that, in Aramaic and Latin with subtitles, what was the reaction in Hollywood? Well, first of all, that it was an anti-date movie, not exactly a career move. How many people tried to talk you out of doing this film? Oh, man. Everybody. He laughs at his pal Jack Nicholson. And up and Jack was wearing this lime green sort of stripy shirt. And there's a little more of them than there used to be. And uh, he, he's choking down an ice cream cone. And I went up to him and said, hey, Jack, how you doing? He said, how you doing, kid? And like that. Said, yeah. Good, good. He says, how's Jesus treating you? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody almost change your mind? No. No. Not really. And now it's too late. I mean, I might as well just push the arrow through. You said... Either crazy or an act of genius? Yes. Which? That's an unfair question. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking me to comment on whether I'm mad or a genius. I think, uh, hmm, I think I'm somewhere between Howard Stern and St. Francis of Assisi on the scale of morality. I, I don't know. But almost from the beginning, Gibson's statements fueled controversy, like last summer when he seemed to imply that the Holy Ghost had given him the one true version of the story. You said the Holy Ghost was working through me. I've received a lot of ridicule for that statement. I think that the Holy Ghost is real. I believe that he's looking favorably on this film. And he wanted to help. I could always use a little help. Do you believe God wrote this film? <laughs> wow. God ordains everything. God made my bed, you know. It's, um, you know, it gets into semantical kind of like questions like my kids ask me, did God make the car? You know, it's, nothing happens by chance. I think it's one of the things that worries and concerns some of the critics, that this is presented as truth, but if God ordained it, you're saying this is the version. No, not at all. It's it, it, not at all. It really is my my vision. I'm not boy. I'm not taking myself out of the equation here. I'm a proud bugger. I did this, but I did it with God's help. I mean, this is my version of what happened, according to the Gospels and what I wanted to show. The aspects of it I wanted to show. And then he says a seismic rumble began. My detractors play hard. They say I'm a bigot. I'm anti-Semite, uh, and then, you know, what really makes me crazy is they say he's an anti-Semite for like a year, and then they said, we never said that, but, but that's all I've been reading. So what about that charge? A lot more of these questions coming up. Once again, Diane Sawyer. If you made a kind of religious map of America, here's how it would look. 82% of Americans identify themselves as Christian. Of those, 6 in 10 are Protestant, a quarter are Catholic, and the rest are Christians of different kinds. 2% are Jewish, less than 1% Muslim, and 13% of Americans say they have no religion. So there's a wide spectrum of belief in America. What happens when that spectrum looks at one movie on the screen? Most of the thousands of people around the country who've already screened Mel Gibson's film are his target audience, evangelicals, Catholics, bishops, pastors. Many of them react with ecstasy and weeping. But there are some people who have seen the film and left distressed. In fact, the movie seems to be a kind of Rorschach test, one picture, multiple perceptions. It's as if they've seen a different movie. It's not surprising at all. Dr. She's Amy Jill Levine, Dr. Daryl Bach. Dr. Philip Cunningham, members of a panel of interfaith scholars we ask to help guide us through the differences. First, the tension between those who see the Bible as literal history and the scholars who say it's one interpretation of historical events. And then there are the differences between Christians and Jews across a cultural divide. 
Dr. Cunningham told us he was surprised by something that happened long before this movie at an interfaith conference. The question of the participants was, what emotions come to you when you see a cross or a crucifix? The Christians uh, all said, I think of God's love, I think of salvation, I think of, of Jesus and the gospel. Then when the Jews spoke, they all said, I feel fear, I feel terror. Um, I was very troubled, I was disturbed, I was pained. Abraham Foxman, head of the Anti-Defamation League, who slipped in uninvited and watched the movie among Christian evangelicals. It is so powerful. And I looked around the room, and 5,000 people were either in stunned silence or wailing and sobbing. He has been the leading Jewish critic of the film, saying that in that room, he feared it poured fuel on the embers of a dangerous past. Did the Jews kill Jesus? He was born in Judea, into the house of David, right? He was a child of Israel, among other children of Israel. There were Jews and Romans in Israel. There were no Norwegians there. The Jewish Sanhedrin, and those who they held sway over, and the Romans, were the material agents of his demise. You know, critics who have a problem with me don't really have a problem with me in this film. They have a problem with the four Gospels. That's where their problem is. And that is what is written in the New Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Gibson believes, as do 60% of Americans, according to an ABC News poll, that the Bible is historical fact. Do you have a literal belief of the Bible, every sentence in it? Yes, yes. You either accept the whole thing or don't accept it at all. So what about the historians who say that the Gospels were written long after Jesus died and are not entirely fact, but political points of view and metaphors? Historians, you know, have argued that, in fact, it was not written at the time. These were not eyewitnesses in oh, the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But historians yeah. have said mm -hmm. they don't think so. They may have written a little afterwards, but there were the people that were there who saw it could relate these stories. But none of these people wrote in a vacuum. So we'll start with the facts both sides agree on. First, that there was a Jewish man named Jesus who created unrest by the message he preached. It happened at the time the Jews were under an oppressive Roman occupation, and the Roman governor was Pontius Pilate. There are suggestions that the Jewish priests were appointed by and collaborated with Pilate, but only Pilate could give the final order to crucify and did, often. Modern readers don't know that the Romans crucified thousands of Jews during the Roman occupation of Judea. But this is where the consensus breaks apart on the central question of who really took the leading role in the death of Jesus. Many historians argue that Pontius Pilate had all the power while the Jewish priests handed over the agitator only in order to survive. But contrast that account to the gospel accounts, all four of them in phrase after phrase, saying that the Roman governor Pilate is reluctant to kill Jesus and does it only because of pressure from the Jewish leaders and the insistent crowd. Let's look at the Pontius Pilate. Read the gospels, Diane. You look in there, he was pressured by all of them. That's the gospel accounts, one, two, three, four, all have the same thing. But there are histories which talk about the fact that he was a brutal. He was. Ruthless. He was. Never hesitated to mm -hmm. crucify Jews, yes. lots of no, them, who yeah. knows, thousands of he them. He did, and he got in trouble for it. Got in trouble, got called back because he was too ruthless. That's right. Where is that in your version? Where is their fear of him? Oh, he's, I think it's present in the film. It is present there. He's the guy on the top. They're all appealing to him. They can't condemn anyone to death. He has to do it, and he does. It's as if the Jews ruled. The Romans were only pawns in the Jewish hands. No, come on. Look what the Romans do. They're pretty monstrous. But Pontius Pilate... He washes his hands and condemns a man to death. That's monstrous through weakness because he's intimidated. It's inexcusable. He's just as much a monster as anyone. Are you anti-Semitic? No, of course not. <laughs> and here's the other thing. For me, it goes against the tenets of my faith. To be racist in any form, to be anti-Semitic, is a sin. 
It's been condemned by one papal council after another. There's encyclicals on it. Which is, uh, you know, to be anti-Semitic is to be unchristian. And I'm not. Do you think Mel Gibson is an anti-Semite? No, I do not. No, I do not. Do you believe this is an anti-Semitic movie? No, I do not believe it's an anti-Semitic movie. I believe that this movie has the potential to fuel anti-Semitism, to reinforce it. And what about that charge that Gibson deliberately or not is playing with fire? Critics pointing to images like the Jewish high priest Caiaphas so powerful and repellent. And the large bloodthirsty crowd. All echoes, the critics say, of what were called passion plays, which through the ages used to inflame Christians against their Jewish neighbors. Ghettos were sacked, the Jewish populations terrorized. Jews knowing the history of passion plays, knowing the effect of personally being called a Christ killer, are going to see a much different movie with much different resonances. The Vatican even issued warnings, like one in the 60s, asking for a measured depiction, not blaming all of the Jewish people. Hitler went to a passion play and came away saying that, you know, this is a, this is a precious tool in the fight against Judaism. Yes, but Hitler was a maniac, okay? Hitler was a madman. He was also an occultist. You know, he was into devil worship. He, he believed in the superiority of the Aryan race, and he was like all this old Norse Viking kind of stuff. That's what he was into, okay? He was a monster. So... Uh, he was already like that. I don't think a passion play turned Hitler around. Now, the fact that they had to make those encyclicals about anti-Semitism meant that there was some abuses going on in society. But that's people. People can be horrible, you know? And to the members of the Jewish community out there who, f who have said that you're not an anti-Semitic. No. And this film is not anti-Semitic. That's right. But, but their fear is in a world in which horrible things have been done to the Jewish population. Right. That simply looking at these events will once again mm. incite people toward, if not violence, animosity, prejudice. I don't think so. I don't vindictiveness. see. Vindictiveness. Well, see, I don't think you can say that. I mean, I, I watch Schindler's List, and, and, you know, what the Germans do, and that is, is horrible, you know? But I don't hate Germans or want to hurt them or anything. I mean, if you go by that rationale, any story where one group of persons does something to another group of persons, I mean, you shouldn't put any of it on film. When you hear their fear, mm -hmm. yes. what, do you, what do you think? Oh, I, my heart goes out, of course. And I want, to, I want to allay those fears, you know? And Gibson says in that spirit, he changed some scenes because of this woman. Do you recognize her face? She plays Mary, the mother of Jesus. She is actress Maya Morgenstern. She is Jewish. Her grandfather died at Auschwitz. Her father, a Holocaust survivor. She says her father read through the script with her. We, we found the, the, the script beautifully, very poetic, and very philosophical. But certainly the most contentious scene of all has been the one news reports now say Gibson has taken out. It takes place after Pontius Pilate has washed his hands of Jesus' death. Jews in the crowd say words calling down a potential curse on them and their children. They only occur in one gospel. Here they are. Matthew 27, 25, and all the people cried, his blood be on us and on our children. Yes, Matthew 27, 25. Um, all right. I felt it was better to take it out because I think my critics uh, have said of this line that, and it's, it's uh, uh, said that, that all Jews for all times are cursed by God. They call this curse on the head for all times. This is not true. All Jews for all times are not cursed by God. All right? But a couple of seconds isn't enough time to sort of go into the nuances of the theological meaning of this. It just isn't. Gibson says the words will not appear on screen in the movie, but I ask if they're still in there in Aramaic. The scene in, is it there in Aramaic even? You can hear it, but under the crowd, you know. But it doesn't appear. 
um, erasing history is never a good idea. What's needed is education and, and how it should not be interpreted in a way such that Jews get hurt because of it. How should it be interpreted? It isn't inviting a curse of God in that sense. It's simply saying, we think what we are doing here is right. And because we think what we're doing is right, we will also take responsibility for it. And why not add one more sentence? But there and Foxman done. says that Gibson could demonstrate such goodwill if he would just add a postscript to his movie using these words. Don't have hate, don't leave here with hatred of the Jewish people. Just say that mm. out loud. I don't think, mm, yeah. Well, that assumes that there's something wrong with my film, you know, for me to do that. And I don't think there is. Once again, Diane Sawyer. Matera, Italy. The actor Jim Caviezel not only endured the freezing cold, his shoulder was dislocated in one scene and his skin accidentally flayed for real in another. All the time he was playing the Jesus Gibson in vision, not like the ones he'd seen before. Bad hair, he's usually fairly a feat and, um, and not a powerful presence, which clearly he must have been. As we said, this film is rated R because of the startling violence. It's very violent, and if you don't like it, don't go, you know. Why so much of it? I wanted it to be shocking, and I also wanted it to be extreme. I wanted it to push the viewer over the edge, and it does that. I think it pushes one over the edge <sighs> so that they see the enormity the enormity of that sacrifice, to see that someone could endure that and still come back with love and forgiveness, even through extreme pain and suffering and ridicule. My first reaction was horror. I'd watched two hours of absolute brutality like I had never seen before in the cinema. Dominic Crossan, no Jesus doubt. scholar and former priest, says he thinks Gibson put brutality at the heart of Christianity. Gibson answers he didn't, crucifixion did. I've read books from doctors about uh, what a crucifixion is like. You just have to be up there and you're suffocating the whole time and birds land on you and you know try and get your eyes out and all this kind of stuff and flies lay eggs on you and you're maggot ridden and it's horrible. But Crossan has another problem with Gibson's film, context. He says the teachings of Jesus were revolutionary, threatening to the authority of the Jewish leaders and the Romans. The film gives no explanation for the hostility to Jesus. It seems to come out of nowhere. Isn't he this nice person that goes around telling everyone to love one another and patting babies on the head? And then somebody killed him. That makes no sense. So you could say it's out of context. Fine. <laughs> I think it's complete for what it is. It's the passion of the Christ. So, and like 12 seconds of resurrection. Let's say I'm a Martian. <laughs> I'm just watching this film. All the time I keep saying to myself, what's anyone got against this guy? Yeah, yeah, you're right. If you were a Martian, <laughs> I know what you're saying. You're right, it's not there. And it's a piece of 12 hours of the thing that I found to be the most intense point of the sacrifice. Now, I know the rest of the story. I know how it went down. Not everybody does. Maybe they'll find out. Um, it's not my job, you know? My job is to make a, a film as well as I can make it. And to do that, he has said, he helped his visual imagination by reading books. One of them, a collection of the vivid and some say lurid visions of a 19th century German nun named Anne Emmerich. Gibson also carries a church relic from her. There it is, it's right up the top there. But that brings us back to Gibson's critics who argue that Anne Emmerich is notoriously anti-Semitic, dreaming scenes where Jews are more violent than the Gospels say. Gibson says anti-Semitism was not in the passages he read. Famously anti-Semitic. Oh, well, well, I never read that, so here's the deal. In my film, I didn't do a book on Anne Catherine Emmerich's passion. I did a book according to the Gospels. And he points to another scene in the film where Simon of Cyrene, a Jewish bystander forced out of the crowd to help, interlocks arms with a bloody Jesus as they struggle with the cross. That's his brother, you know? 
It's about another human being. We're all children of God, all of us. It doesn't matter what you are. Whether you've got a bone through your nose, or whether you look like a Viking, or a, a Spanish conquistador, or whatever you are, you know. It's, um, we are all children of God. But was the violence on screen a reflection of the fierce personal battle he says he once fought within? You thought of jumping out a window? That next. Mel Gibson's passion will continue in a moment. Mel Gibson's passion. Here again, Diane Sawyer. When America first met Mel Gibson, he was the brash road warrior. He grew up in a devout Catholic family, born in upstate New York. The family moved to Australia when he was 12. And he was still in his 20s when he conquered Hollywood. Oh, I really won't miss that guy. He's, uh, wow. You know, that's a 22-year-old photograph. <laughs> I'd like to throw darts at him. Uh, not going to miss that. Don't want it. It's a drag. It really is a drag. He says 13 years ago, the man on all those magazine covers was in fact drowning. And it was just like, I just didn't want to go on. Why? What? Okay, I'm afflicted with, you know, everyone's got something. I'm, I'm the, I, I, I would get addicted to anything. Anything at all, okay? Was it alcohol? Yeah, yeah, mostly. It was, yeah. Look, it doesn't look like a rummy. No. <laughs> Drugs? Drugs, booze, anything. You name it. Coffee, cigarettes, anything. All right? I'm just one of these guys who is like that. That's my flaw. But you talked about the fact that you went on benders, got into fights, mm -hmm. was hell to live with. Mm -hmm. And they said five pints before work. <laughs> five pints of oil, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Beer. No, it was just to, you know, keep the throat lubricated, you know. Sometimes I used to drive inebriated. I mean, this is, this is the height of careless stupidity. And when you think about that kind of insanity, and that you, I look back to that now and I go, what was I thinking? I was, a, I was a wild boy. And we grew up in the 60s and 70s and, you know, wild times. Just what kinds of carrying on. What flaws shall I expose to the world here? Yeah, it's, uh, um, you know, done a lot of things I'm not proud of. Like to hear another one? <laughs> you got my attention. Yeah. Tell me another one. True confessions on national television. Okay. Um, oh gosh, let me see. Ooh, here's a beauty. Now nah, I don't want to. I don't want to do this. This is horrible. This is awful. <laughs> yeah. I'm really a good guy. I mean, the the real medal goes to my wife, who's uh, a wonderful woman. You know. What did she do? What did she do? She hoped for years. Robin, his wife of 24 years and mother to his seven children. She's the best friend I have ever had. She's just great and would be there completely 100%, 110% and to put up with me. That's already a tall order. So, hey, I'll spend the rest of my life giving her medals, more precious than jewels. But Gibson says several times he had tried to turn his life around but kept failing and was brought to the brink of suicidal despair. You know, I checked into a few places and, you know, sorted myself out. I didn't make a big noise about it. You thought of jumping out a window? I really did, yeah. I was looking down thinking, man, this is just easier this way. I don't know, you have to be mad. You have to be insane to despair in that way. But that is the height of spiritual bankruptcy. There's nothing left. But it's, it's uh, that, wow, what a waste. And that people do that, it's so sad. Whenever I hear a suicide, I just want to die, you know. I want to cry. And it's, a, it's uh, because it is, there's something better if they can just hang on a little longer, you know. It's awful. Uh, so, anyway. Oh, did, is this the crying segment? Did, wait a minute. Yeah. Wait, did, did someone say something? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> did someone say something to you? Or you oh, said it to yourself? I said it to myself at this point. But that was years of other people saying, hey, you know, bud, you got a problem. I think I just hit my knees. I just said, help. Yeah. And uh, then I began to meditate on it. 
you know, and that, that's in the gospel, you know. I, I read all those again. I remember reading bits of them when I was younger. Pain is the precursor to change, which is great. That's the good news. Not only did he return to the faith of his childhood, but he built a church for the practice of what is called traditionalist Catholicism, a very strict, very private church defined in entrenched opposition to the Vatican, specifically the reforms issued in the 1960s. Reforms which include celebration of mass in modern languages and more inclusion of other faiths. So when we talked with Gibson and his actors, we wondered, does his traditionalist view bar the door to heaven for Jews, Protestants, Muslims? That's not the case at all. Absolutely not. It is possible for people who are not even Christian to get into the kingdom of heaven. It's just easier for, and I have to say that because that's what I believe. You I, have the nonstop ticket. Well, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm saying it's an easier ride where I am because it's like, uh, I have to believe that. He says journalists are making it all so more mysterious than it really is. I'm just Roman Catholic the way they were up until the mid-60s, you know. Before Vatican II. Yeah, and that's uh, the Latin Mass with a properly ordained priest. And, uh, and it's never been abrogated. Abrogated means never been outlawed or stopped. It's always been perfect. It's still perfectly okay to do that. You just don't see it very often. There's a lot of confusion around, particularly amongst Catholics. I mean, if you talk to a Catholic, they're confused. They're in crisis, many of them. Not all of them. Now, when this happens, and you don't know what to do, and you lose confidence, St. Paul tells us in the Gospels that it's best to hold fast to the traditions. Particularly, he says, a Catholic who has been as confused as he. You know, I'm not a done deal. I'm a work in progress, and I'm extremely flawed. And I better continue to think that way, too, because... Uh, because it's the truth. When we come back, questions about the Pope's endorsement of the film and Gibson's father. Gotta leave it alone, Diane. And uh, so let's get started and let me introduce you to Mel Gibson. This is what happened when the passion met the promotion. Ooh, it's a big group, isn't it? No. <laughs> Not only did some churches buy tickets in blocks of 20,000, they're calling it the best evangelical tool in 2,000 years. Go to this R-rated movie. Some of the churches are offering interactive CDs, framed photos, books about the movie. How does this make Gibson feel? If you're not gonna get the, you know, the Burger King hookup, you know, the Last Supper meal or something. It's like, you know, I, I you know, I, uh, this, this is the United States of America, and that sort of happens. But for a moment, it seemed the biggest promotion of all would come from none other than the Pope himself. He screened the film, and according to published reports, said it is as it was. What did the Pope think of your film? Well, apparently he said it is as it was. And then apparently he didn't. And then apparently he did again. And then, you know, went back and forth. I don't know. Maybe there was a, a janitor there in the office at night that pressed that uh, press secretary's button and sent a message and he didn't mean to send it. I don't know. He's talking about an email he says was sent to his camp, but adds that word was passed to several independent reporters, too. They all had confirmation from his personal secretary that he said that. Now, then all of a sudden it was, uh, they were backpedaling, I don't know why. Why would they I, say it, then pull back? Look, I, I don't know, I don't understand why. It's, it's a mystery to me, I don't understand it. But it doesn't really matter that much because, you know, it's what it is. <laughs> it doesn't need to be, it is as it was, it's just what it is. The apparent Vatican flip-flop is just one of a series of things making the director feel under siege. Is the world full of conspiracies to you? See, it's gotten bad name conspiracy. <laughs> it's only logical to assume that conspiracies are everywhere because that's what people do. They conspire. If you can't get the message, get the man. So I think that's what we're engaged in here. We're engaged in character assassination. And one journalist Gibson has singled out is New York Times associate editor and writer Frank Rich. Rich complained that Gibson was only inviting token Jews to his preview screenings. Rich did not get an invitation nor see the movie himself, but lashed out with a series of disparaging essays, three of them. Did you say of Frank Rich 
I wanted to kill him. Mm -hmm. I want his intestines on a stick. I want to kill his dog. I did say that. Well, I was on the phone at the time to my publicist who, um, you know, had just been called by Frank Rich. Frank Rich had called him, because he's, he's good at calling names. He'd called him a, a Holocaust denier defender. He would called my publicist that, right? And his parents were survivors from the Holocaust. They got like numbers on their arm. And I was like, felt bad for him. So I said, I said that to him, but it was more like a joke, you know, and I was blowing off a little steam, you know, at the same time. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm sorry I said that thing about Frank Rich's dog. I would never, never want to hurt a dog's feelings. Do you want to say anything else to him? Frank? God bless you, Frank. But what about Rich's serious accusation that Gibson generated controversy to sell his movie by going on television months ago to complain about Jewish criticism that didn't even yet exist? He's also said that you're baiting Jews. But the transcript indicates that the interviewer talked about Jewish reaction, that Gibson was complaining about the New York Times. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. The, uh, uh, I think as soon as they started filming, that beacon of journalistic integrity, the New York Times, uh, was, you know, dispatched someone to go down there and take advantage of my father um, even before I could finish filming. So, but... You know, do you think they really want to know what my dad has to say, or did they ever want to know before I started making this film? I don't think so. It's a, it's a, it's a thing to try and drive a wedge in between a man's own flesh and blood. That's my father, okay? I love him. And if they're going to try and drive a wedge in there, it ain't going to happen. Gibson's father, Hutton Gibson, age 85, who has written books and a newsletter with some decidedly provocative terms of phrase. He has called the Pope Garrulous Carolus the Koran kisser. And in that New York Times Magazine interview, he seemed to be questioning the scope of the Holocaust, skeptical that six million Jews had died. So what does Gibson think? Do I believe that there were concentration camps where defenseless and innocent Jews died cruelly under the Nazi regime? Of course I do, absolutely. It was an atrocity of monumental proportion. And, and you believe there were millions, six million, sure. millions? I think people wondered if your father's views were your views on this. Their whole agenda here, my detractors, is to drive a wedge between me and my father. And it's not going to happen. I love him. He's my father. And you'll, you will not speak publicly about him I'm tight that. with him. He's my father. Got to leave it alone, Diane. I'll leave it alone. Once again, Diane Sawyer. That's a wrap! As of tonight, there are some signs that The Passion of the Christ might even turn out to be a hit movie, producing the joke out in Hollywood that now everyone will rush to make the sequel. 25 million or 40 million of your own money on it? Gee, somewhere between there. I don't know, 30, probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were you to have that no. much of your own money in it? No, no, no. Uh, uh, well, I was doing all right on 28 bucks a week as a garbage man, you know, 28 bucks a week and all you can eat. It's, uh, it was fine, you know. It's fine. It doesn't matter stuff like that. I've never worried about that, ever, ever, ever. But what about Mel Gibson's superstar, the box office yeah. lethal weapon? Hey, you want to see crazy? I'll tell you. <laughs> Can you go back to making those That's films after character. this? You know, I just, I, I'm kind of, I don't know. I don't know. I don't feel like I want to. I don't feel like I want to get in front of a camera anymore. I like getting, you know, just being a slob behind a camera and watching other people look good. You know, I might not hurry back. Um, I might go and go somewhere no one can find me. You know where that is? You know where it's the place that no one can find you? I was thinking of pitching my tent right next to the weapons of mass destruction. Then no one would find me. In the meantime, the film continues to generate a kind of national conversation with people from all sides weighing in in sometimes surprising ways. 
The Reverend Franklin Graham, son of Billy Graham, says he liked the film, but that he's going to do everything he can to make sure no one blames the Jewish people. Jewish leader David Elcott, while raising concerns, asked that everyone be more careful about leveling charges of anti-Semitism. And religious groups of all faiths are asking, is this the time to start talking about our different views? God sending someone to die in place of someone is a love letter. By raising Jesus to new life, that tells Christians that all of us are destined for new life. We need to learn about each other. Jews, I think, would do well to understand how precious the story of the Passion is for their Christian neighbors, and actually maybe sit down and read it. Um, Christians, on the other hand, need to know how painful the history of the Passion has been for their Jewish neighbors. Let's get this out on the table and talk about it. You know, this is what the Talmud says, this is what the Gospel says, let's talk, let's talk. People are asking questions about things they've been buried a long time. So who killed Jesus Christ? The, the big answer is, we all did. I'll, I'll be first in the culpability stakes here. There's an argument that says Christians are more culpable in Christ's death than our non-believers. It's your hand in the film holding the nail? It is. Yeah, my left hand. In Italian, sinistra, or sinister hand. Jesus Christ was crucified for all men, of all creeds, for all time. And he died for all of us. There'll be a lot more on all of this tomorrow morning on Good Morning America. And one more note, we should point out that all of us at ABC News who worked on this report learned a lot about each other too. We hope you join in our conversation. I'm Diane Sawyer. See you in the morning. Good night.